Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our live online worship service at Elliott Church in, in Newton, Newton, Massachusetts, for those of you who are with us from other states and other states of mind as well. Um, we thought we had problems last week when we gathered on Sunday. Today, Martin Luther King Jr., the apostle of nonviolence, would be appalled, dismayed, and more than a little frightened as we all are today at the American spectacle this week. That network of mutuality, remember how he put it, that garment of destiny, which King described all of us as being part of, was shredded last Wednesday. We gather for worship this morning under a state of open presidential misrule. We react with revulsion at the presidentially incited assault upon our Congress, our capital and our democratic ideals, and we condemn it. This morning we are here though to collect our souls, to recollect our calling in Christ and to reflect on the next steps in our church's mission. We welcome you on this second Sunday in Epiphany, which is why you still see the, the star above Dr. Elizabeth's head and mine, uh, which we'll be observing for the next four weeks. Um, Dr. Elizabeth and Monique and I and our two soloists, John and Connor, uh, welcome you in the spirit of Christ. And providentially, we have as our guest speaker this morning, the Reverend June Cooper, our friend um, and executive director of City Mission of Boston. And what a Sunday it is for her to deliver the message from the word of God for us on this occasion. She had no idea when she accepted this, of course, that this would be the additional burden uh, and responsibility and opportunity, which it is for us to uh, re-enter the word of God and see ourselves in it in this current situation that we're in in our country today. So therefore, let us joyfully worship God. Let us listen to these words which call us to worship this morning. Rev. Rick and I will share them. Sing joyfully to the Lord your righteousness. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Yes, and praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. God is faithful in all that God does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of God's unfailing love. And now please join us as we sing the first two verses of our hymn for this morning, Arise, Your Light Has Come.
once again, we remind you to mute your devices, please. Thank you. First chapter of the book of Isaiah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation. I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. from scripture before I offer it I would just remind you once again would everyone double check make sure that your device is muted and uh, Wheaton I'm speaking seeing yours is uh, needing to be muted. can you thank you okay everybody that's good thanks um so the reading from Holy Scripture this morning is from the prophecy of Ezekiel in the second chapter. God said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. 
he said to me, mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants, <clears throat> their descendants are impudent and stubborn. I'm sending you to them and you shall say to them, thus says, thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. And you, O mortal, do not be afraid of them and do not be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns surround you and you live among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words and do not be dismayed at their looks for they are a rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear for they are a rebellious house. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's good to see you. Um, it's good to be in your homes, you know, and in those, I see you all in those little boxes. I just wish I could be with you, putting my arms around you and getting a big hug. Um, and I want to thank you for the invitation this morning on this hard, hard morning of what's going on in our world, but a good morning, a good morning to be in the spirit of God and to worship God with you. It is such a joy and delight um, to be with you. And I wanna thank you for the work that you do and our partnership over these 19, many, 19 years. I can't believe it. I could have a child in college as long as I've been at City Mission. I could have a lot of things going on, but um, it's been a great journey. And as many of you might know, I'll be taking a pause not retiring, just a pause. And um, at the end, at the end of May, um, and so uh, I'm so looking forward to continuing my work and ministry uh, in the Boston area. Um, let us just pause for a word of prayer. Oh God, of this new day, a day with sunshine, uh, we stand in your glorious light. We thank you for the opportunity to come together in little boxes to worship you, but to be your community, your community of faith and your community of love. 
Oh God, I'd ask that you would allow your spirit to infuse and in, envelop me as I attempt to bring your ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. So um, this has been a tough week. I talked to your pastor on several occasions. In the morning of Wednesday, we were glowing in the light of the good news that uh, two, um, two folks uh, flipped the Congress. Uh, one, an African-American man who is my sister's pastor. She lives and goes to um, uh, that church in uh, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and Joe Olos, who's a Jewish man. Um, these are going to be two fine people um, going to the Senate. And it, it was a sign of light because we know that brown and black people and many others got out and, and voted in record numbers. And so we were so happy about that. But by, by two o'clock, my phone was ringing off the hook. Maybe it was 2.30. Uh, and our attention was uh, turned to the horrible coup um, at the nation's Capitol building. The events of Wednesday left many in shock. Is anybody in shock from Wednesday? See a hand. Anybody, two hands if you need them, two hands in shock and terror. But what unfolded? Uh, many people have said, that's not us. And some people have said, we're better than that. And some have said, how could people really defile the sacred halls of power? This was unprecedented. But Wednesday was epiphany and a day to shine a light on what cannot stay in the dark. And clearly what we saw on Wednesday did not stay in the dark because what was unmasked on Wednesday was white nationalist supremacy and domestic terrorism no longer in the dark. Since 2016, the number of hate groups in this country has doubled. We've also seen during that same period of time, the number of killing of brown and black men and women at the hands of the police. Hate came to visit us on Wednesday. Evil came to visit us. Violence came to visit us. There were soccer moms, elected officials, mail carriers, grandmothers, welders, farmers, pilots, dentists, veterans, all in the mob. Wednesday was not a dress rehearsal for the issues that we're going to have to grapple with in this country. And I'm so grateful for the witness and the ministry of Dr. King, who said about changing this world in a nonviolent way. Sadly, perhaps some of our friends and family were in that crowd. I received a message just yesterday from one of my former Sunday school kids. And she said, she attends a white evangelical church in Boston. And she said, I don't condone the violence of what happened at the Capitol on Wednesday. Broke my heart to hear her say that as a Christian. The Catholic bishops call for accountability and reconciliation and repentance. But here, as we stand on the hills of Dr. King's birthday, and I'm so glad we're here doing it a week earlier because this is the time to be talking about Dr. King. Um, Dr. King was the 20th century greatest prophet and it is more important now, it's urgent for our hearts and minds to listen and to learn and to follow his witness of nonviolent civil disobedience, coupled with the strength to love and to do justice. You see, for Dr. King, justice flows from a place and the heart of love. Justice is love distributed and given away to others. King would often say, I have decided to stick with love because hate is too great a burden to bear. As many of you all might know, in 1994, Congress passed legislation making the King holiday a day of service. 
transforming that the day of King's birthday into a day where volunteers and students and congregants and uh, civic minded people would get together and do all kinds of acts of service. And the banner under which all this um, is, is like everyone can be great because everyone can serve. Life's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing for others? But over the years, we've allowed corporations and government and community agencies to hijack King's own words and legacy to uh, superficial responses to what are real crisis in school funding, public transportation, infrastructure, pollution, poverty, and inequality. We have safely castrated the legacy of a man who resisted violence, who agitated for social justice and for change in a racist society. A man who didn't come from the majority people, but came from the disinherited and the disallowed. A man who put his life on the line many times, a man whose home was bombed, a man who went to Memphis, Tennessee to lead a strike for fair labor and wages for black men. A man who was stabbed and jailed over 15 times. King was a man who loved words like freedom, equality, justice, and love. He suffered and died for it. And his ministry changed the world and has changed all of us. So community breakfasts, gospel singing, and community service are all great. Don't get me wrong, because City Mission offered a big day of service for many, many years. And they make us feel good. But will those things help us confront what we're looking at now, white nationalist nationalism, that, which is going to threaten, which is threatening our self-ruled institutions? Will it eradicate COVID-19, a global pandemic which is out of control? Can it deal with the tragic loss of death that this virus has wrought upon our nation and our world and deal with the massive grief? A breakfast and service days up to the task of distributing the vaccine and getting small businesses up and running and dealing with the massive unemployment rate. Will the annual MLK breakfast and day of service re rebuild an immigration system that is, rebuild an immigration system that will be just and fair and welcoming? Will it help expand affordable housing and establish a policy that would make housing a basic right? Would it help us define the right to vote for all, defend the right to vote for all? Would it help us address the vast inequalities that we see in our economic and our racial systems that exist in every institution from healthcare to education, transportation and criminal justice? Would it get a, will they get us clean water? So I could go on, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not. But if, if we think of where we are at today, we must do something differently now. The urgency is now. I don't know, you might be familiar with King's last sermon that he gave at the National Cathedral. He, it was entitled, Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution. And he tells the story, he starts it off with the story of Rip Van Winkle. Does anyone remember the story of Rip Van Winkle? Hands, anybody? Okay, very good. I just want to make sure you're awake. <laughs> the story of Rip Van Winkle. So Rip Van Winkle goes up the mountain and there is, when he goes up the mountain, there's a sign, a picture of King George III of England. When he come down 20 years later, there's a picture of George Washington, the first president of the United States. When he looks at the picture of George Washington, he was amazed. He was completely lost. He knew not who he was. And this reveals, as Dr. King says, it reveals to us the most striking thing about the story of Rip is not merely that he slept for 20 years, 
but that he slept through a revolution. He slept through a revolution. When he was snoring up the mountain top, snoring like I do, um, a revolution was happening, taking place that would change the course of history. He knew nothing about it. He was asleep. And one of the great, one of the greatest liabilities of life is that all too many of us people find ourselves living amidst a great period of social change, and yet we we have not developed new attitudes, new mental responses uh, that new situations demand and require of us. So we end up sleeping. But if we're going to do something different in the face of what we saw on Wednesday. We need to stay awake. We need to really stay awake. Dr. King said that we need to learn to live as sisters and brothers, or we will perish together as fools. He said we are tied together in a mutual, a single garment of mutual destiny. In the African tradition, we would call this Mbutu. I am because I am who I am because you are who you are. I will not be who I am supposed to be until you are who you are supposed to be. Dr. King presented this as a way that God's universe is made. It's the scaffolding that holds humanity together. We have passed many laws and legislation and King would be very proud of that making segregation illegal, yet we live in a segregated world. We have white, we continue to have white flight to the suburbs because of better schools and opportunities. I oftentimes have the privilege and maybe some of the pastors would testify um, and, and have noticed this. I have the privilege to conduct funerals and weddings and I get to see family social networks. And I would say 80% of the time, the people that are there look like the people that I'm performing the wedding for. I don't see a lot of diversity. I don't see people mingling with people from different walks of life and different racial and economic groups. And we have to do that. We have to get to know one another. Last year, in an effort to do this, I decided that City Missions board and staff, we were going to be breakfast crashers. <laughs> Not a wedding crasher, but we crashed an MLK breakfast. And the breakfast was at the Catherine Drixel um, Catholic Church in Dorchester, right in Eggleston Square. And it's a very diverse community. And I wanted my board, which um, is a multicultural board, I wanted to let them see what the community MLK breakfast looked like. So we crashed the breakfast and that breakfast looked exactly, I think, like God's kingdom, kingdom is going to look. You see, we have to learn to be in close proximity to one another. And that might feel uncomfortable to some, but it is what is required of us. We have to learn to get along with one another. There was a German pastor who said, first they came for the socialists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unions. I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. They came for the Jew. I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. You see, we have to learn not to categorize people. We have to learn that we can and should speak for one another. The second point in that sermon that Dr. King would advise us to do in terms of doing it different and staying, staying awake is that we have to work in a very passionate way and unrelenting, unrelentingly to get rid of the disease of racism. We must, he says, we must face the saddest hour of the week, 11 o'clock, when we stand and sing as Christians, in Christ there is no East and West. 
it's time church for some truth telling because we have some blind spots and many of us should not have been surprised about what had happened on Wednesday because we could see this backlash coming for years since this country elected its first black president. But we could see the backlash coming and we just have had been in a time where it has been okay for people to take their white sheets off and reveal themselves. As Christians, we must realize that white supremacy has infected our churches and the United States from the very beginning. We need to relearn or learn our history lessons, folks. There is a need for white Christians to systematically repent of white supremacy. We've been complicit, all of us, in America's original sin, racism, truth-telling, truth-telling because something's missing. We're, there's some blind spots. We need to understand that we stand on the land of native people and we need to acknowledge that our early settlers. We need to understand that enslaved people were, were catapulted into boats named Jesus, mercy and freedom to come to America and experience the brutal middle, uh, middle passage. We need to understand that many of our slave, the slaveholders were also members of our churches and do some deep digging around what is that and why and how have we become the people that we are today. You see, people bring, we bring our stereotypes about people to church situations. A few weeks, a few months ago, I was at a church. I walked, it was a, it was a year ago, before COVID, I walked into a church and it was Wednesday, it was a day for the food pantry. Instead of being asked, to where I wanted to be directed, I was immediately told, you look like you're looking for the food pantry. <laughs> you look like you're looking for the food pantry. There's some unsettling truths here that we have to face, my friends, but this is the only way to salvage the integrity of our faith. We're at that moment now City Mission for the la last year, in 2019, we did something called a pilgrimage of truth and justice. We went to Montgomery, Alabama to see and experience the work of this wonderful humanitarian named Brian Stevenson, who I think some of you might know. And in doing that, we had 50 people from various congregations and non-congregations around the city. We were able to help people understand and connect the dots between uh, slavery and the school to prison pipeline. Slavery didn't end with the Emancipation Proclamation. It has continued. Many people will say the truth will set you free. I reframe that and say the truth will set us free. This isn't about you and me or them or those. It is about us as people of Christ being able to stand strong and sing together about a Christ who knows there is no east or west or south or north. We're just one people. We all bleed the same color. The truth will set us free. And finally, in closing, I would be remiss if I didn't speak about the fact that Dr. King was a man of God Sometimes, because the day of service has been sanitized, people forget that he was more than a civil, uh, a civil engineer of society, but that he was a man of God. And any and all the work that he did was inspired by his faith. He believed in the God of history, a God who will right all the wrongs, a God of a, of a moral universe, that is longer than our span will be. But what that says to me is that we have to continue to resist evil and hatred, powers and principalities that we saw 
on Wednesday. We have to resist that and pull that arc of justice down to love. Love is stronger than hate. King was a faithful prophet because he believed that all the work of justice, all the work to make, to make change was rooted in God's love. God who loves us so much that God calls us beloved. And I'm always taken back when I have people sign up to do the protest for the housing project and they say, we're going to go down to the protest. And by the way, there will be one on Wednesday. <laughs> I'm inviting you to come with me. Um, we're, but say, you know, we want to have enough housing for everybody, but not in my backyard. That is not justice done with love. Love says, come on in. You know why? Because there's room for everybody. We love everybody and everything. My friends, we are at a crossroad in our world. And once again, let us choose the selfless love that Dr. King has, the selfless love that God sheds on us every day. Henry Nouwen says, and love is stronger than fear, life stronger than death, hope stronger than despair. We have to trust that the risk of loving is always worth taking. And we can take that risk. Oftentimes, Dr. King would call on Mahalia Jackson, or if he was in a Black Baptist church, he would call on someone to sing that song, and you probably know it. Um, and it's a song of assurance. It's a song that says, you know, God is with us. The young people would say, you know, in order to do justice and love, we need to put on our big girl panties. <laughs> we, we need to do that, uh, beloved. We need to do that with the assurance of these words uh, written by Thomas Dorsey that Dr. King loved and cherished. The words go like this, precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me on. That's our song. We're gonna sing that song because we have some dark days ahead. Let's sing that song knowing that our hand is in God's hand. So let's stay awake and let's do something different. Amen.
dear friends, let's let's um, allow God to take our hand right now and enter into this uh, intimate opportunity to speak with and share our cares and concerns and our joys for this day uh, together. Um, momentarily, I'll uh, invite you to uh, unmute, unmute yourself and share your prayer request, which I will follow each time with um, a response. Oh God, in your love, hear our prayer. Um, I would like <clears throat> the privilege of beginning um, by asking prayers for Tom's friend, Laura, um, who died this last week, uh, and, uh, and to lift up prayers for her husband and two children. For Laura, oh God, in your love, hear our prayer. And I see that Martha is there. Do you want to offer your prayer, or shall I? Um, I'll be glad to do it. I just, last year we said prayers for my twin brother and I'd like to continue prayers for him and for his health as he's working through some more health issues. Um, they're of concern. And I have a second one. Should I do it now? Let me offer a special prayer for Steve first um, because we've, you um, kept us informed through his illness uh, for some time now. O oh God, in your love, hear our prayer for Steve. Amen. And your other prayer. And I have a cousin, Virginia Morneau, who um, was diagnosed with cancer and has had surgery and is now going through treatment. And um, I'd just like to pray that the treatments go well for her health and her family. O oh God, for Virginia, for her health in this um, challenging uh, experience, health experience, and for her family, uh, oh God, in your love, hear our prayer. Amen. I'm going to put everybody on my screen so I can see if there are others. Forgive me for the delay. If I see a hand. Elizabeth, am I missing anybody? Oh, um, Chuck, Chuck, please. I just like to offer a prayer of uh, thanksgiving for the for June Cooper and the leadership that she's brought to the City Mission Society and to the City of Boston for all of these years. Oh God, we lift up June and in your love, hear our prayer. Amen. Uh, is that Natya? Uh, yes, um, it is. Uh, I wanted to thank Reverend Cooper for that beautiful and inspiring sermon. I pray that we all realize that we are brothers and sisters and that there's no need for us to fight each other, that the more united we are, the better this world will be. Um, and on a sadder note, I'd like to pray for our friend Marcel, who was diagnosed with cancer of the tongue. And um, he's only in his early 50s, a wonderful, kind, hardworking young man who will be undergoing chemotherapy treatment very soon. So I pray that his healing is quick and complete. Natya, I didn't hear his name. Marcel. Say it um, again. M-A-R-C-E-L. <clears throat> oh God, in your love, hear our prayer for June in thanksgiving for her inspiring words. Amen. And hear uh, our prayer for Martel, whom we lift up. Oh God, in your love, hear our prayer today. Amen. Rick? Uh, June. Yes, I, I, um, you all have a sign out in front of your church that gets a lot of attention. <laughs> I hope so. Which one are you referring to? Black Lives Matter. <laughs> and, um, and I want to thank you for having the courage to, to put that sign out there and keep that sign out because 
um, I work with many congregations who wouldn't have and don't have yet the courage to do that. So I thank you for your witness, your witness and your love in doing that. Thank you. We pray for, we pray for our congregation's witness. So oh God, mm -hmm. in your love, hear our prayer. Amen. And by the way, June, we're working on a bigger and better one to go up along the, the columns at the top. We're trying to find a brief uh, quote from Martin Luther King's uh, 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 wording to, to share. Maybe you'd help us with that uh, in the coming week. Um, not seeing any other hands. Uh, if, uh, if I, Michael, oh yes, thank you for waving. Michael, please. Uh, yes, I would just like to uh, ask how I personally can do more to support the work of um, City Mission. Sorry. Let us uh, take that up in the coffee hour, June. That was our whole purpose, and we will do that with God's blessing. Oh, God, in your love, hear our prayer for new directions. Amen. Mm. Shall I then offer a, a prayer on, on all our behalf? Um, Let us pray, O oh God in heaven and on earth, look at us. We awaken in distress at the shattering of our cherished ideals and the attack on your divine law. You have commanded that our rulers follow a wise and blameless course. You have commanded that they go about your house in purity of heart, that they reject any sordid aim that they silence those who spread tales behind people's backs. You have commanded that they choose servants whose lives are blameless and that no liar shall set themselves up where you can see them, O God. All this you have enjoined upon your leaders. Let it be so again and soon. O God, we awakened today feeling like that child on the beach whose sandcastle has been just been trumped by a band of teenagers. What did we do wrong, oh God? What did we do wrong that a national wish for inclusivity and for equity should be so heedlessly despoiled? Oh God, we feel newly vulnerable to new depredations. What society can possibly bear the arbitrariness, the willfulness and the contrariness of some of our leaders, oh God, don't they know that what people willfully break breaks, destruction destroys? Oh God, if the people who do these things do so because they feel they have nothing to lose, then we have a ministry here to embrace that you have opened up for us. We have a ministry. We, our churches, our mosques and synagogues have a new ministry to embrace to inspire faith in, uh, in others, faith not only in you, but the kind of faith that leads to confidence in each other and upholding the dignity of each other. We have a ministry to re-embrace, to instill hope in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of this pandemic, where there have been 375,000 deaths and just untold suffering that goes with all the hospitalizations and all the workers who receive and heal um, uh, with little rest um, and insufficient pay. All this, this kind of ministry of hope is, is ours to embrace. And most of all, <clears throat> oh God, you have given it to us to multiply love in our midst, love everywhere. And that love has to be shown warmly individually and collectively in any possible way we can as we seek a new path here, as we seek a new politics, a new direction that you're calling us to, which we should embrace as followers of Christ, we should also be leading it. And for this, we ask your, your guidance and your special light today and in the days and weeks to come. Yes, we need something we need to do something different and to do it, do it enthusiastically in your spirit, in the spirit of forgiveness. We finally conclude by blessing 
asking a special blessing on our friend June. May you wrap your arms around her during these concluding months of her service uh, to the people of Boston and surrounding areas through the city mission. Um, she already has served so faithfully that we know you have designated a special star for her crown in heaven. But in the meantime, she has more to do and you will <clears throat> embrace her and walk with her through the, um, as she seeks a new path uh, forward in her ministry. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to, to pray together, which we will now sing with Monique at the piano. before we go out singing, um, we renew our appeal to all of you, our members and friends, to continue to uh, support uh, the work and ministry of this congregation, uh, which is on this wonderful corner in Newton Corners, uh, this intersection where our ministry can be seen and heard and felt, we hope. Uh, and we do continue to, to work very hard um, during this COVID season when we're not getting together in person, but like we are right now, please know that your church and uh, the church's ministry is forging ahead. And uh, I know it's going to be, uh, we're, they're telling us it, it's going to be another spell before we do get together. So let's keep faith with each other and um, keep in touch um, out there with each other and you with, with me and our staff, uh, Dr. Elizabeth, um, as we go forward. Thank you for that. And uh, so let's um, go out with the last two uh, stanzas of a, a rise. <clears throat> Your light has come. Let me just add a word of thanks to June for that wonderful message and the chance to momentarily to join back together in the coffee hour after we um, get some coffee and uh, we'll reunite with her and talk some more. And now I turn it over to you, uh, June, please, um, for your parting uh, blessing today. 
Okay, so I know you guys are still awake because I can see it in your eyes. So, so what we're gonna do is something maybe uh, Reverend, your reverends have asked you to do this. We're gonna join hands on Zoom, but it's sort of like a virtual kind of thing. So if you could just put your arms out like this and let's pretend we're embracing one another. And we can feel each other's hands and the warmth of these bodies that we haven't been around in so long. You're looking beautiful. Okay, so let me get this benediction going because my arms get tired. I looked and I saw a great crowd of men and women and boys and girls standing hand in hand looking one another in the eye, unafraid. And I asked the angel of the Lord, what is this? And the angel of the Lord said, this is the kingdom of God. And I asked the angel of the Lord, where is this? And the angel said, this is in your heart. And I asked the angel, when is this? And the angel said, when all of my people treat and love one another the way that I love you. I want to invite you to go and to be that light for someone, to go and look others in the eyes and always to know, to know that God got your hand. God's got your hand. Amen. Let's Amen. go with you. Amen.